Good morning. This is Deborah Rubin. I'm here to welcome you to our webinar this morning. We're looking at a series of papers all dealing with the topic of feeding the world in the year 2050, how human and internal capacity development can support agricultural innovation systems. Our session today is the kickoff event for a three-day ag exchange that will take place tomorrow through Thursday. And you can sign up for this Ag Exchange on the AgriLinks website. Um, it will show up as a link in your links box on your website. You should be able to see that to the left of your screen. It says Ag Exchange Registration. And we encourage all of you to participate as much as possible. We'll be operating 24-7 over the next three days. Our agenda today has three parts. We're going to have a short introduction by two speakers from USAID to give us some background on the materials that we're going to be hearing about. And then we're going to be followed by three presenters who will be reviewing the content of three different reports that look at different dimensions of human and institutional capacity building related to agriculture innovation systems and agriculture more broadly. And finally, we're going to have a question and answer session towards the end of the morning today. And this will allow for you to participate as well, not simply to listen to the other experts. Although you can hear us, your participation is going to be through inputting into the text box, the chat pod, that you should be able to see at the lower right-hand side of your screen. So I'd like to start this morning by introducing Rob Bertram, who is now the Chief Scientist in USAID's Bureau for Food Security. Rob has extensive experience overseeing a wide range of USAID's investments in human and institutional capacity building. Rob will be formally introducing the webinar and setting the stage for us in just a few minutes. Rob will be followed by Susan Owens, who is the Division Chief for the BIFAD Division in USAID's Bureau for Food Security. Susan has been closely involved in coordinating a number of studies related to capacity development in agriculture, and she will be providing us with some background to the reports that we will be hearing about. Susan will also introduce the presenters um, uh, who are primarily authors or coordinators of the reports themselves. So I'd like to remind you that your input can be provided by typing into the chat box. We encourage you to type your questions, and we will be taking those questions and uh, relaying them during the question and answer session. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Rob Bertram. Thank you, Deborah, and, and good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure to welcome you today to this webinar launch of the USAID and BIFAD Ag Exchange on Human and Institutional Capacity Development that will begin tomorrow at 9 o'clock Eastern. The primary goal of the Ag Exchange is to identify emerging priorities and needs in capacity development that will help inform our programming and research assessments going forward. On the first day of the Ag Exchange, participants will discuss effective programming tools and resources. Day two will cover key constraints and possibilities, and the third and final day will conclude with a discussion of promising practices such as the use of technology in helping build human and institutional capacity. I highly recommend that you register to participate in the Ag Exchange if you haven't already done so. As Deborah has mentioned, the website for the registration is in the links pod on your screen. During the webinar today and the Ag Exchange that will begin tomorrow, we look forward to hearing from you on how human and institutional capacity development can best support agricultural innovation systems that build towards achieving Feed the Future goals, which are to reduce global hunger and poverty. In particular, they are seen as essential to the sustainability of our investments and the gains we can all achieve. 
Four years ago, when Feed the Future was established, the role of science, technology, and capacity development in supporting and driving agricultural innovation was recognized. In fact, I would say that capacity development is recognized across the board. For example, in terms of the value chains investments, which characterize many of our USAID missions programs, and the entrepreneurship that needs to underpin those. And this really, I think, comes back to the whole concept of country-led. This is the, the idea that if our partner countries don't prioritize something, we probably shouldn't either. But uh, in order to follow the lead of our partner countries, we need to work with them to equip them to, to provide that leadership. And I think it's the, uh, our focus in our human and institutional capacity development that uh, does just that across all five areas. Some of you may have seen a, a diagram in which we characterize a, uh, a series of, of capacity building efforts from analysis and data to research to education, extension, and entrepreneurship all of which support farmer-centered innovation at the center of our theory of change. In the area of research, um, we had a strong basis as the collaborative research approach that, approach that was the hallmark of the CRISP programs laid a solid foundation. In designing the, F, the Feed the Future Innovation Labs, we built on that strong foundation in addition, and in addition put in some dedicated programmatic expertise and best practices through programs like Innovate, which focuses on curricula development at all levels, MIAS, our Modernized and Extension and Advisory Services programs, Africa LEAD, which focuses on uh, developing uh, leadership in a whole range of skill areas, including the private sector in Africa, and uh, through our Borlaug Fellows programs, which cover a range of capacity building opportunities at the individual level and which increasingly, I should add, feature leadership as a, as a thread. Um, and all of these, and particularly those, those, the, these capacity building investments I've just mentioned, I think are based on the premise that ultimately we want to engage our USAID missions with us as partners, that, or we want to engage with them as partners. I think it's the other way around, really, because we, we like to think of them being in the lead. In the area of policy, the strategy took a bit longer to evolve, but ultimately it is about fostering investment at all levels, public and private, local, national, regional, and global. And here again, we think capacity development is essential, in part because ownership is critical. We talk about policy analysis, implementation, and mutual accountability. All of those, I would argue, depend on adequate capacity being there on the part of our partner countries. Now, in, I just wanted to share a few thoughts before I turn this over to Susan, but I think some of you have heard the quote, and I wish I knew where it came from, capacity is development. It's a very attractive concept, but I'd like to go one step further and add functional capacity is development. It's that functionality that is essential and which, frankly, has in some of our past efforts not always come to fruition. So our efforts going forward need to be different more effective and more durable than some of our investments in the heyday of capacity building, which was really many de several decades ago. But now we are back in this business, very happy to say, but we need to do it in a way that really is, I would call it, 21st century style. And we need and want your views, experiences, and insights in how to do that, how to make use of advances in technology, best practices, or theories of change, uh, institutionally or in terms of human development. Now, a critical challenge that is being raised everywhere we look is this question of the institutional piece. How can we get towards functioning partner institutions? And importantly, how do we build, how do we link the H, the human piece, with the I, the institutional piece? How can our new tools be applied? And please, I, I want to encourage all of you to think ahead not about where broadband is now, but where broadband is going to be in 5, 10, or 15 years. We, we really need to be building towards the future as we think about our investments going forward. And broadband is one example. There are certainly others. What sort of partnerships between U.S. universities and developing country counterparts can be envisioned? What are the priorities for focused curricula that need to emerge in key disciplines, be they biophysical, 
social sciences, or maybe some sorts of more specialized evidence-based decision making. And another important area, soft skills. This is an area where we know our US-linked investments and partnerships have excelled. One of the key gains, in fact, from residency programs that have been a hallmark of graduate training that involves our US university partners. But as we go forward and increasingly are compelled to focus on the institutions themselves in developing countries that are going to pick up the burden and deal with the emerging youth bulge, we hear so much about this these days, how are we going, how can we think about building soft skills into those programmatic efforts as well? Um, similarly, if somewhat less exciting, is the question of back office skills. Another important area where I hope we can think of new cost effective and, and, and uh, high impact approaches for building those types of institutional capacities which are still essential uh, to, to the real leadership that we're seeking from our partners. Uh, please also remember the pivotal role of USAID's missions. They have to be our partners, not the only ones. We don't want to underestimate the importance of partnerships with the World Bank, the Gates Foundation, other donors. But, but working with and through our missions is, is really going to be essential in terms of translating a vision into reality, be it around technology, be it around gender, be it around nutrition, any of the, 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 the goals that we're seeking, we, we really need to think about how to partner with our, our, our colleagues in our USAID missions overseas. And I hope that throughout this Ag Exchange, you'll take into consideration public, private, and other types of partnerships that will also take us towards those same goals. So I'm delighted this morning to be part of the webinar that launches the Ag Exchange and to introduce you to at least some of the questions and concepts uh, and definitions that we think can help shape our, uh, our thinking going forward over the next few days and, and then well beyond. Uh, we are going to start this morning with an overview from Susan Owens. Susan is my colleague who leads the Human and Institutional Capacity Development and BIFAD Division in the Office of Agricultural Research and Policy and has been a, a major shaper of our thinking and policy in, in this whole area of endeavor. Susan will then be introducing us to the authors and contributors from three commissioned reports on human and institutional capacity development that Deborah mentioned. And we look very much forward to a lively discussion over the next three days and to really gaining from your insights so that the programs we, put, we seek to put in place in the years ahead reflect the best, most productive, and most informed thinking available. Susan, over to you. Good morning. Um, okay. Uh, as a thank you very much, Rob, for the introduction and for the uh, really inspiring comments. Uh, welcome to all of you to this webinar. Thank you so much for your participation. We're very excited to see participation from d different parts of the United States and from Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and other parts of the world. This is this is great. Uh, I'm pleased to provide. Um, background this morning on recently completed USAID-funded studies on human and institutional capacity development. One study was commissioned by the USAID Board on International Food and Agricultural Development, and the other two studies were undertaken by the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities. First, a bit of background. <clears throat> USAID uh, developed and approved a new policy on human and institutional capacity development in 2010. Part of the agency's effort to strengthen the capacity of organizations to face the challenges of the 21st century. The new policy recognize, recognizes that to successfully build capacities of partner institutions, investments shouldn't only include degree training, but short courses, a wider range of informal non-training interventions, expanded use of social media and technology, and other types of workplace learning. Overall, USAID HICD policy takes an institutionally based approach to capacity development. At around the same time,
time and in the same time frame, with the exception of one study, um, uh, USAID has supported the preparation of um, several reports related to long-term training and institutional capacity development. These include the three that we will hear about this morning, all of which investigate both successes and gaps in USAID HICD program and provide guidance for future investments. These reports constitute a launching po point for this ag exchange. Uh, we hope to go beyond uh, the studies and, and, and look towards the future. Uh, just, to, just a very brief word to say that, as Rob mentioned, USAID Bureau for Food Security under Feed the Future has um, invested in a suite of uh, human institutional capacity development projects that um, we that are maturing now and that uh, where we need to be planning for the next generation of projects. And we look forward to your feedback related to that as well. Um, OK. Uh, each of our panel members today will review the content of each of three reports and offer thoughts about implications of report findings for future USAID investments. The three reports are the BIFAD Review of Strategic Human and Institutional Capacity Development Issues and the Role of USAID and Title 12 under Feed the Future. I know that's a long title. The second study uh, that was funded by the Bureau for Food Security but um, carried out by the APLU is called Good Practices in Leveraging Long-Term Training for Institutional Capacity Strengthening. The third report funded by the USAID Africa Bureau is called Africa Higher Education, Opportunities for Transforming Change for Sustainable Development. Before starting our discussion, I would like to alert the audience to a glossary of terms that has been prepared by the Ag Exchange team and is available on the AgriLinks website. You can easily look at these um, definitions, which are also on the screen. We would like to highlight in the human institutional capacity development definition, the fundamental definition to reflect the wider view beyond training that we just mentioned. We also, under the Ag Innovation System definition, we'd like to emphasize um, that the concept of innovation is a complex set of connections within an interlinked system of many different participants working together to create and apply new knowledge. Finally, the performance improvement definition stresses the need for regular monitoring and evaluation, not simply of outputs, but of larger functioning and learning within an institution. Once again, this is a, the ag innovation um, approach involves a systemic approach, an interlinked approach. We hope that in the discussions today and over the next few days, we will be able to discuss and further refine our understanding of these terms. I would now like to introduce our three panelists. Dr. Mark Varner holds a position at the Association for Public and Land Grant Universities, where he is a senior counselor to the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development, BIFAD, and APLU's international programs. Mark came to APLU after 30 years at the University of Maryland, where he was a professor of animal and avian sciences. Mark will discuss the BIFAD Commission study. Mr. Andrew Gilboy, our second panelist, is a senior partner at Associates for Change, a consulting firm that has worked with USAID, providing technical assistance and conducting evaluations on HICD-related topics. In addition to the report, he will be discussing today, Andy co-authored two reports that have proved particularly helpful in evaluating USAID's work on participant training. Generations of Quiet Progress, the Development Impact of U.S. Long-Term University Training on Africa from 1963 to 2003 is the first, and another, Agricultural Long-Term Training, Assessment and Design Recommendations. Our third speaker will be Anne Claire Hervey, Associate Vice President for International Development and Programs at the APLU. 
Anne Claire is also director of APLU's Knowledge Center on Higher Education for African Development, which collects, analyzes, and shares knowledge about capacity building of African higher education institutions and systems. Anne Claire works closely with USAID on aspects of higher education's role in development and its implication for African higher education. I will now turn to the speakers and thank them in advance for their presentations. We will allow each speaker to complete his or her presentation and will respond to questions after all the speakers have finished. So I'll turn the mic over to Mark. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to uh, be uh, online with all of you from around the world today. Thank you for your participation. The study that I wish to talk about uh, and I uh, was a report that was commissioned by the Board for International Food and Ag Development, or BIFAD, at the request of Administrator Shaw from USAID. The review team is Vic Lechtenberg, a professor and ag dean at Purdue University, Albert Diani, a uh, faculty member at Rutgers University, Ralph Christie, a faculty member at Cornell University, and finally, Carol Kramer LeBlanc, a longtime USDA uh, Foreign Ag Service uh, and USAID uh, consultant. I served in a facilitator role for this team. The resulting report is available for download either from the file downloads pod on the left of your screen or through the links pod on the left of your screen. And the re report has 14 recommendations. Uh, those are in four key categories, and you see them listed on your screen today. I'm going to focus today, instead of uh, reading all of those uh, 14 recommendations to you, I'm going to talk instead about the key ones that relate to the ag innovation cycle. So after the report was uh, delivered by the writing team, BIFAD considered those report findings and recommendations. They communicated their report to USAID Administrator Shaw and provided some of their own insight into the report's recommendations. You see the link towards the bottom of the screen for BIFAD's comments. USAID Administrator Shaw responded to BIFAD, and uh, his letter is at that link that's on the screen uh, also. The next steps is, are uh, listed, and those include USAID Administrator Shaw uh, highlighting that the principal focus of the recommendations deepened was HICD and deepen the support for higher education partnerships, which is a key USAID priority. Secondly, our current e-consultation with broad key stakeholder groups is supported, and this is the first step we're taking today and then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, the next three days. We hope to hear from each and every one of you in that online discussion. Now, in implications for innovation system, Susan, uh, uh, thank you for your definitions of an innovation system. The subtitle uh, on this slide describes how the team saw it a little bit, where these were uh, networks of organizations or enterprises or individuals that were focused on bringing new products or processes or forms of organization into some kind of economic use together with institutions and policies that affect their behavior and performance. So the first recommendation I'd like to highlight is to strengthen uh, in institutional capacity and partnerships. USA, it was recommended that USAID should establish long-term preferred institution partners programs. Now, this was a host country insti uh, higher education institution with two U.S. universities that were highly experienced 
in the ag innovation system. This was not meant to be a high cost uh, program. Instead, uh, alluding to what Rob Bertram talked about before, a lower cost but long term relationship to focus and help that host country higher education institution to focus on priorities to solve and alternatives. And in reality, to capitalize on their strengths because all of those host country institutions also have important strengths. The second key category was to enhance collaboration between developing country institutions, U.S. institutions, and public-private sector. The first subpoint there, broker collaborations across countries with national governments to develop public-private partnerships. There are some good and notable examples uh, available today, but most of, uh, that go transnational. However, many of those are just public partnerships and uh, focusing on involving the private sector would really help strengthen uh, those host country institutions related to agricultural innovation. The second point here is to work with country leaders and institutions to strengthen university curricula relevant to agriculture and food sectors. The importance of this was highlighted in last week's Twitter chat uh, on youth and agriculture. And uh, those of you who are Twitter conversant can uh, search for hashtag agchat and see the results of that. But Two key issues came out of that, one that, that related to this report. One was relevancy to ag, to make sure that that curricula is relevant to today's agriculture. And second, to create excitement about careers and innovation in agriculture. After my 30 years of working with uh, youth at the University of Maryland, uh, young people are very good at innovation. And there's tremendous synergy in involving them in that innovation system. And uh, we, uh, the BIFAD team, really thinks that's important. Next, in uh, and last, in the categories of recommendations is building developing country access to US technologies. This has two key Subpoints. First is to invest in and nurture scientific and education networks. The report team heard and, and read about and considered these and that they're going to be much more dynamic in the future than in the past. And they offer great opportunity for host country uh, innovators to capitalize on their local competitive advantages. And that's a really important point. The last point uh, on the screen there is to enable US and Feed the Future higher education institutions to develop technologies for smallholder agriculture and small and medium agricultural enterprises with a vision of making food and ag production a business that attracts and inspires youth. This is important for a key reason and was highlighted at the last BIFAD public meeting. The award winner for the BIFAD Innovation Award uh, is Kelsey Barale, a grad student at UC Davis. And her research highlighted that, that women farmers in the highlands of Guatemala needed to participate in innovation systems in a different way than do other uh, farmers, bigger farmers or male farmers. Now, remember that these smallholder agriculture and the small and medium enterprises are often women. And uh, this is a really important part of where, frankly, the rubber hits the road for doing a good job on these. With that, I want to thank everybody and look forward to your questions. And uh, Andy, I look forward to hearing what you have to say 
all the way from Vietnam. Andy Gilboy, please take away. Okay, can people hear me now? Now we can hear you, Andy. Thank you. Great. Okay, I'm having a few difficulties here from Vietnam, but good morning, everybody, or good evening. It's a pleasure to be asked by uh, the group here to talk about HICD and important, uh, performance improvement. So uh, I'll just uh, get started and hope that the connection lasts. So I've had a few ups and downs here, but forgive the shaky connection. I'm calling from Vietnam where we're launching a five-year program with the USAID mission uh, using some of the HICD uh, vehicles to improve performance with their local NGO partners. So it's uh, quite exciting, and I'm very happy to be calling from the field where, of course, the work is done. So let's first talk uh, today um, I'm going to ask someone to move the slides since I can't do that um, from my computer. So uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about is capacity building. That is the institutional side of capacity building rather than the individual side. Then let's take a look at the limits of training in building capacity and improving performance. Why training often does not improve performance in an organization. Then, if training, that is long-term degree training or short-term training, technical training, if that is what you do, that's your principal contribution, then how can we leverage that training to produce more impact at the organizational level in the home institution? So that, that's what I'd like to take a quick look at. So let's move to the next slide. Now, by the end of this brief presentation, can we begin to answer this question? The title of the consultation is Leading the Field in 2050. So I'll let's give you a moment to read this because I refuse to read PowerPoint presentations. So take a second to read it. I'll be quiet, and then we'll move on. Okay, so the question is, why is training insufficient to meet the goal to feed the world in 2050? Provocative question, and I just want to get started and take a look at this. So next slide. Here's a classic view of capacity building in an institution. We have the institution, and we use the one mechanism we know best, training. And the assumption is, that we've had for decades is that if we apply the training to the individuals in the organization, it's only obvious that the organization's performance will improve. Next slide. But an institution is comp comprised of these components uh, uh, that are integrated systemically. The first is its reason for being a raison d'etre. Um, you know, what is the purpose for this institution? What results are they intending to provide to what target population? Then they have processes, obviously, processes inside the institution, uh, human resources, financial, procurement, IT, asset management, that organize support to produce whatever they're producing and to deliver the services they intend to deliver. None of this is rocket science. But I just want to run through it because I think you'll see uh, how we've been neglecting certain things. So the third place, of course, is people. Obviously, people work in institutions, and they are the ones with the competency and the uh, knowledge to actually produce the results. Now, these components are dynamic, they are fluid, they're integrated, and if the animation on the PowerPoint actually worked, you would see these arrows all moving. And that's the point of the slide. These are complex systems. They're not simple. They're not just complicated. They're complex. And they require complex um, assessments and intentional 
interventions to make a change. So you can easily see from this why a classic uh, organogram or organizational chart doesn't possibly begin to reflect what actually is going on in an institution. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Well, I don't know if you're hearing me, so I can't tell. Um, hold on just a second, see if I can get some word that we are I'm being heard. I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, Andy, we are hearing you, so please continue speaking. Great, thanks. Could someone move that slide ahead? So anyway, I'll go ahead even if the slide doesn't move for some reason. Um, the next slide we're on is the, the zone of slide. competence slide. Uh, we're, no, it's the institution. Uh, that's the problem. I can't see it. So I'll move back to the institution where the people are circled. Well, the problem is I can't see it, but you can, which is fine. So on that slide where it's yes, uh, entitled we're institution, now. You have, oh, perfect. You have the raison d'etre. I just got disconnected. So. Um, from the computer. So we'll have, you have the raison d'etre at the top, and we, I circled people because this is where we have focused to build capacity. We've trained people, and we've improved their technical skills, their knowledge. In fact, we've done it very well. But is this sufficient? Now let's go to the zone of competence. Next slide. So here's another way of looking at an organization. It's functioning at a high performance level when these three components work in harmony. On the right, you can see the uh, requirements of the organization, systems, policies, you know, what actually uh, defines the different systems in the organization that make it work. On the left, you've got your job descriptions, procedures, criteria for recruitment, things like that. And finally, at the bottom, of course, you have the people, the individuals with, with their competencies and skill sets. Um, Everybody knows this, but it's useful to look at where we've placed our emphasis. The intersection of these three uh, components of an organization would be what we call the zone of high performance. It's when these three are working in sync that you do get um, extraordinary performance. Um, but look where we put our, our capacity building funds and attention. We've really looked primarily at the individual on the assumption that if we increase the knowledge and skills, we would get capacity improvements and performance improvements in the organization. But what about these other places? We pay very little attention, shown by the dotted arrows, to what really is essential in an organization beyond the individual competence levels. So the next slide is another way of looking at an organization. It's uh, Gilbert's behavior model, which is the most widely used tool in understanding how to improve organizational performance. Thomas Gilbert created his six boxes in 1978 to more accurately reveal the nature of an institution. So what he did really was provide the essential link between knowledge and behavior. The top row lists three aspects of an institution that, do, that have to do with its working environment. The um, bottom row deals with the individual knowledge, capacity, and motives to actually perform the work. So Gilbert devised a simple test, which I've actually administered over 100 times overseas, where employees are asked to identify the single most important constraint that if removed would lead to their increased performance. Now they don't know that each answer is actually correlated to one of the six boxes. So the result is that on average 67% and 
quite often much higher, of the respondents select the work environment is where their main performance is. Sorry, is where their main performance constraint is. And the one box on the upper row, on the left information, receives by far the most choices. So what's the finding here? The finding is that the vast majority of employees in an organization are telling us that to improve performance, we need to improve the work environment. Only one third of the people tell us that they need more training, that they need higher knowledge of their particular area or better skills. Yet again, where do we put our capacity building dollars? We put the dollars on, uh, you can go to the next slide. You can, we put the dollars and the money and the attention on the lower level, the individual level, as you can see by the arrows. We provide training to individuals primarily. The upper level, the environment in which they work, that's pretty much uh, very little attention. So, what can we do? If we are, in fact, long-term degree training institutions, and that's what we do well, what can we do in addition to that to leverage training so that when the, when the graduates return, they actually can help improve, improve the work environment and the performance of the institution? So we can find ways to equip these graduates with performance improvement tools and experience. Um, they're, they're listed actually in our report. We, we go into some detail uh, describing the things that you can do with, inside existing scholarship programs or long-term academic training programs. So the, the objective is so that, that these students, when they return, they become change agents, change actors, champions for change. Now, few people really know how to do this instinctively, but anybody can learn the tools of change management and uh, performance improvement. And so what, we, what we're hoping and we're urging U.S. institutions to do is to incorporate a whole series of um, skills and attitude changes in the graduates that they're training so that they, when they return, they actually become uh, instrumental in changing the, the work environment in which they find themselves. And so that releases the creativity and the innovation that we hope they can use when they return. So now, let's take the next slide, which is the same question we asked. Have we answered this question? Well, we know that if we use training as our main way to build institutional capacity, we won't have high performance institutions supporting these brilliant scientists who have returned to try to improve people's lives. We have to address the complexity of organizations through the proven HICD approaches so that there is a dynamic environment where scientists can, can really do the work they know how to do. And that's the point, uh, the main point that we want to make. So, which leads us to the last slide. Um, an often cited comment from one of the gurus of the performance industry. In fact, I'll let you read it because it doesn't appear in my um, notes here. If you pit a well-trained person into a dysfunctional system, the system will always win. So are we returning highly trained, incredibly brilliant agriculture and social scientists into dysfunctional systems and calling this capacity building? That's the main question. So let's check out Andy, the study. Andy, thank you so much. Uploaded. And so I have, that's the end of my presentation, but check out this little case study on the link to the left, and you can um, uh, get a real-life example of some of the things you can do. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and sorry for the uh, bad connection. Thanks, Andy. We'll turn now to Ann Claire Hervey, and she will be our last presenter, after which we hope to get more questions from you all about the presentations. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Andy. So, and thank you all for, for listening in from all over the world. Good morning and good afternoon and good, good evening. So I've been asked to share some of the relevant highlights of a report that was commissioned by the Africa Bureau of USAID. 
And this report was on African higher education. And we were asked to look at what the major challenges were and opportunities and to provide recommendations to the agency for future funding. And so this report was not on the role of higher education in the agricultural innovation system specifically, but I think there are a lot of relevant lessons from the report for our discussion. And there are three, uh, three ideas that I'm hoping you'll take away from this presentation. The first is that higher education matters a great deal for poverty reduction, for economic growth, and for innovation. It matters for development. Second, that a greater proportion of our development assistance dollars should be going to building the capacity of higher education in Africa than we are currently allocating. Higher education is the bottleneck in the system in Africa. It, it, higher education lags behind all other regions in the world on a number of dimensions. And of the 2 billion people predicted to be added to the planet by 2050, half of them will be African. So Africa needs investment in higher education now in order to meet future needs. And third, if we are trying to grow access while also improving quality, African higher education institutions need to transform themselves. So we should be helping to support this transformation and not supporting tweaks at the margin or simply adding a few hundred PhDs and masters to the faculty and calling that institutional capacity building, as Andy talked about just a moment ago. We need to be engaging on a scale and with a scope where, where our investments and support can help to change the institutional rules of the game. So what is the evidence for my first point that higher education matters for economic development, poverty reduction, and innovation? There have been a number of recent studies on the returns to schooling, uh, many of them looking at the so social returns, which I'll talk about why that matters in a moment. And this one here is um, a very recent one by the World Bank that came out in 2013 that reveals that the returns to higher education today are very high. And we, we, there is a perception, I think, that remains that the returns to basic and secondary generally are higher. And the recent analyses do not support that perception. In a number of regions, um, the, the returns to higher education are more than double the returns to primary and secondary. And Sub-Saharan Africa is the region with the largest returns. And this, again, reflects the fact that higher education is the bottleneck in the system in many African countries, given the very large numbers of students now coming up through the pipeline from primary and secondary. So returning to the fact that this is a, an analysis of the social rate, rates of return, that's very important because we know that the private rates of return to higher education are very large. Edu the, the individuals that are able to benefit from higher education generally have higher incomes. But that's not a very powerful argument for investing in higher education in Africa <clears throat> because with so few people having access, then so few people will benefit. It's the public and the social returns that matter. What impact does educating one person have on improving the lives of many? And this is an indication that, it, that that impact is fairly significant. As we move into an increasingly knowledge and innovation driven economy, higher education is going to matter all the more. And not just for Africa's ability to produce new innovations, which is very, very important, but it's been shown that it takes about the same level of economic and technical skills to become an efficient borrower of technology as it does to develop new technology. So making effective use of all the knowledge and, and technology that's already out there on the shelves, that already itself takes a, a relatively high level of training. So what is the evidence that, sorry, I clicked through that very quickly. What's the evidence that the time to invest in, higher, in African higher education is now? And I want to start with pointing out a caveat that we recognize that the, the continent is highly heterogeneous in its higher education challenges, but there are a, several broad trends that we can identify, starting first with enrollment levels. The relatively good news is that, um, that access to higher education has doubled since 1990. Uh, the bad news is that two times a very tiny amount is still a very tiny amount. And Africa is still the region with the lowest enrollment rates by far compared to any other region. And while enrollment has doubled, 
funding, which is the dotted line on the graph on your screen, has not. Um, this has led to serious impacts on the quality of higher education in Africa. And Africa is the only region where expenditure per student has gone down in this time frame. Looking at this from a different lens, here's a picture of the world as we all typically know it. And now here's what the world looks like in terms of relative higher education spending growth over a decade, starting from 1990. Here's what the world looks, looked like in 2001 in terms of relative research and development expenditure. And I could have shown several more maps here um, related to various indicators um, related to higher education. And they would have all looked roughly the same. Whatever lens you use, uh, Africa nearly disappears from the map. Over the first couple of decades of building up African universities at independence, a big focus was on preparing students for job, jobs in government to replace colonial governments. But with the doubling of access to higher education in recent decades, the civil service job market has become saturated. There just are not enough jobs for African graduates today in government. And in this time frame, universities and university systems have not really changed to adapt to this new reality. So facing the tremendous pressures that, that most African countries have faced to increase access to higher education, African political leaders have been meeting that demand by opening up places at universities and vocational schools. But they've been less successful in addressing the demand for skills by retooling their higher education systems to engage more with the private sector and to develop the knowledge, attitudes, and skills, the soft skills that Rob Bertram talked about in his introduction that are demanded by today's labor market. So African universities are now producing more graduates than they have ever done before, but who are less fit for current labor markets. Shifting gears now to what uh, donor support to African higher education has looked like over the last several decades, we've seen a pretty dramatic decline, as you can see here, which became pretty pronounced in the 1980s following the publication of, um, of studies by the World Bank that suggested that the returns to primary education were higher than to tertiary. But today we have pretty clear evidence that that's no longer the case. And so we have started to see a change in direction in funding at a number of agencies, and we hope to continue to see that reversal of the trend line. So how can the US best support uh, African higher education? Given the tremendous challenges faced by African higher education, many African higher education leaders are saying that what is needed is not just institutional capacity building, but institutional transformation. As Andy talked about this a moment ago, dysfunction in any institution means that those institutions are able to harness only a small fraction of the talent and the skill and the creative energy of their employees. So to help champions, African champions for higher education transformation to revitalize their institutions and systems, we recommend in our report that AID do two things. One, recognizing that resources are limited, we encourage USAID to concentrate its investments in a few places and combine system level interventions with institutional level transformation. And we recommend doing this, particularly the institution level transformation through partnerships with peer institutions. And these partnerships should be long term. They should engage the private sector, and they should focus on comprehensive institutional performance improvement, not just working within a department or a school, and not just doing training. These partnerships should, should also be flexible. We believe they should establish residi residency in country. One needs to know the people and the politics to be effective in supporting change agents within institutions. And perhaps most importantly, we need to engage, sorry, I'm one step ahead. We need to engage expertise in institutional performance improvement and change management. And we have, US institutions have this expertise on campus, but it also exists outside. Andy Gilboy is an example of the kind of person that understands this well, and that's the kind of, of uh, expertise 
expertise that we need to engage in these kinds of endeavors. And we en encourage USAID to embrace its HICD framework, which encapsulates a lot of what we've been talking about, and, um, and perhaps uh, go on a mission to a campaign to, to um, teach staff admissions and teach partners more about the HICD framework. And I want to conclude now with an example of a partnership that is currently underway. It's supported by USAID in Tanzania, supported by the mission. And I want to talk about it in order to talk about the potential impact of institutional performance improvement focused on a single institution. Uh, this partnership is, is in, with Ohio State University as the primary U.S. partner working on the ground with Sokolini University of Agriculture and the ministry as well. But the primary institutional performance improvement focus is on Sokolini University. And I want to focus on this because I want to make the case that universities are an essential and sustainable mechanism by which nations can scale up innovation for development. So, as I said, this project is in Tanzania, where 27% of, of Tanzania's GDP comes from agriculture, and 80% of the workforce is engaged in agriculture. Sokolini University has 503 members of academic staff. African universities are mammoth institutions that require a pretty serious intervention if you, if you want to make a real difference. The student body is 9,000 students annually. They graduate 2,000 students per year. And when you consider that there are already 14,000 alumni from the institution, that's over 30,000 alumni by 2022. Imagine the impact that those graduates could have on the agricultural innovation system in Tanzania if the quality of education being provided by the university were significantly enhanced. And I will stop there. The full report can be downloaded on our website, and it is also available in the links uh, pod on the left hand of your screen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne Claire, and thanks to all of our presenters and speakers so far. We're now at the point of our webinar where we'd like to turn the discussion over to our participants. And we've had quite a few interesting questions come in through the chat pod thus far. I think to start with a question to Rob Bertram, um, as he's still with us, but will have to be leaving soon. And this was a question. Um, presented by Elon Gilbert, who's asking, why is the discussion about HICD strengthening coming now rather than at the point where uh, Feed the Future was launched, since it is such an important part of the program? And if it was an important discussion then, why is it getting so much more attention now? Thank you, Deborah, and thanks for the question, Elon. Um, well, <laughs> I don't want to say it didn't get attention at the outset. I think it did. Uh, as I mentioned, we put these investments like Innovate, like MIA, some of the other university-led programs in several years ago now. Uh, in terms of the uh, reason we're focusing on it more now is I think we're coming to a point in Feed the Future where we're looking at the maturation of the first set of programs that were put in place by our missions starting in 2010, 2011, and including our, some of our own investments that were made centrally by the Bureau for Food Security. And I think just as in every other area of endeavor, we want to con continue to be a learning organization. We want to try to refine uh, and share learning going forward such that the next round of investments, which will be starting to be put in place over the, this coming year and the year after it, uh, fully reflect the experience and, and best thinking available now. So I, I, I think beyond that, I would say that we see this as a challenge still. Uh, I think our research portfolio, in my estimation, is is making great progress. I think we are making progress on capacity building, but uh, as Anne Claire pointed out, she mentioned IAGRI. 
I agree is almost unique, maybe not exactly unique, but it's almost unique in the set of investments being made by our focus countries. So we're also thinking about how to build institutional capacity building in more going forward than we did at the outset. So, I mean, you've got a fair point there, Elon, especially if we look, I think, at the bilateral portfolios. Uh, it, it's, it's embedded across all our programming, but there's not too many places where it is the objective per se. So, again, having a basis for continuing that discussion going forward will also be important to us to, to uh, and Ann Claire and I have talked about this, we sometimes wonder about, hey, how can we build on this terrific investment in ways that might spill over to neighboring countries, for example? So, so uh, I guess basically what I'm saying is I want to encourage you and everyone else to really bring your thinking to bear because, you know, it, this is an ongoing process, and, and uh, hopefully if we didn't get some things perfect the first time, we'll get better at it the second time around, but uh, thanks uh, so much. Thanks so much, Rob, for addressing the first question. Um, we also had a, a question from Henry Mwamugemu um, in Rwanda, who's asking uh, specifically to Mark, but perhaps Anne Claire would also have something to say to this, um, how can UID missions better facilitate easy access to USAID technologies, not only for other higher education institutions or other educational institutions, but also for local private companies and individuals, um, which often have a more difficult time making these kinds of connections through the programs that AID supports. So Mark, would you like to take a stab at that question? Thank you, Deborah. I will. Um, the report addressed this issue in a couple of different related ways, and then I'll uh, give uh, two examples from the current situation. The report talked about uh, the uh, preferred uh, network, or excuse me, preferred institution partners between uh, university partners and uh, that, in essence, found good partner uh, universities in the U.S. so that the mission didn't have to uh, re-budget or, or re-compete a contract each time and that the universities could get to know each other and get to know their problems and uh, get to the root of the, some of those kinds of problems. So two key points or two key examples from that. The first time you hear about a problem, uh, there is oftentimes uh, the symptoms of the problem, but doesn't get to the root cause. So it takes a little bit of time and a little bit of uh, effort to do that, thus the long-term nature of that. So in the IAGRI example, uh, the BIFAD report team heard and interviewed uh, the on-the-ground leadership, uh, Dave Crabill from Ohio State University uh, in at, at uh, uh, Sokowini. And the point of the story is they were talking about one of the things they identified, one of the problems they identified, was the lack of uh, cooperation between private sector and the uh, university. And uh, David went to them and said, well, let's start with your alumni. And they said, well, that's a great idea. And uh, David said, well, let's get your list of alumni. Well, that list didn't exist. And so those are the kind, it, 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 an example of those are the kinds of things that uh, the mission has to uh, work through, understand, and resolve from a long-term standpoint. And having a partner who is used to um, working on them and a partner they know they can count on in the long term to come and intercede or, or help them get started on things can really, uh, really help. Thanks, Henry, for a really good question. And thanks to you, Mark, for a very good answer. There was also a question about um, what areas 
still exist for critical research on HICD issues. And I'm not sure if um, Anne Claire, oh, if Andy would like to try and answer that. I'm not sure if we still have Andy online. So we'll ask the question. Well, I'm actually here listening. Oh, great. So would you like to take that, Andy? Because the question was really about your slide, um, one of your slides, and asking what, what research areas are still needed to be addressed. Um, I would just say that the, the whole area of performance improvement and uh, what we recently have named uh, human and institutional capacity development has been researched for decades. I would probably say there's, I mean, there's always ongoing research involving um, um, behavior, the way people react in workplaces, but uh, there's been decades of research on the subject, and you can learn a lot more by going to the website for the International Society for Performance Improvement, ISPI.org. That's the leading organization that, man, that um, researches, applied research, and attempts to uh, produce tools and, and um, aids for people like me and very many other people that w would like to do performance improvement inside organizations, especially in the work environment. So there's a lot of stuff that's been done. I think I would just encourage you to look it up and read a lot about it. There's some, kind of, there's some gurus of the performance improvement world, and um, you'll certainly see them pop up in the research once you get into it. I hope that answers the question. Andy, this is Ann Claire. I, uh, the questioner's question prompted me to uh, wonder whether I know that the, in, the ISPI um, has been around for many years and that this is a, a developed area of study, but how about in a developing country context? Is that part relatively new? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, it's true that it's been more in North America that these uh, um, performance improvements uh, approaches have been used, but it spread pretty well through Europe, Eastern Europe, former Soviet republics. In fact, one of the people that has been sending a question is Stephen Kelly, who's uh, worked extensively in those areas. Um, in Africa, we've been uh, Applying the methods, and of course in Rwanda there is a USAID-funded HICD Rwanda program. And Liberia also, to some extent, we've been working there. And uh, I mean, I think we've worked in Senegal in the Ministry of Health in applying segments. You don't go in with um, a cookie-cutter approach because every one of these, every country is different, every culture, even within a country, you get different organizational cultures, of course. So I think there's there's extensive indication that the same models can be used and adjusted in developing countries to produce similar results. And it's based a lot on systems theory and on basically um, human behavior. And it, it runs pretty much across cultures. People uh, want to be recognized in the workplace for their, for their accomplishments. Uh, all kinds of research um, shows that these, uh, what, what actually works in a North American setting and be very well used in developing countries uh, if it's context contextualized. I think th if that answers the question, I think uh, that's about what I can say. Hello, this is Susan. I just had a comment on uh, each of the last two questions. Um, one thing is that um, one thing that's changed and is continuing to change, as Rob mentioned and as we have been considering, is the use of technology into this and how technology can be employed to transform institutional improvement and human capacity development as well. We, one problem with many of these human investments, human, the training investments, is that they're very expensive. And we, I don't think we're going to be able, so that's another dimension. I don't think we're going to be able to uh, devote the same, the needed, the needed level of resources into the future. So how can we use low cost, relatively low cost technologies to create um, the human and institutional capacity 
um, investment needed to result in long-term performance. So that's one point. This, could I, can I just say one, one more? Um, in terms of Henry's question, uh, Henry, uh, under Feed the Future, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on public-private partnership. The New Alliance focuses on public-private partnerships. So it's and and furthermore, you say it has this um, a, a emphasis on local capacity development. So there's a lot of interest in Washington D.C. and should be at the missions in in bringing out the private sector partnership dimension of, of, of the work that the missions are doing. So I just wanted to mention that we've got a lot of initiatives in place to try to build private sector engagement. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Ann Claire would, thank you, Susan. Ann Claire would like to make another comment on, on this point, on this point. To respond. In response Susan. to Susan's uh, question on technology, can people hear me? Yes, OK. I, there is no doubt that technology has to be part of the solution. And, um, but I think that we ought to be, our expectations should shift towards thinking about technology as a cost savings measure to thinking about as a quality enhancement measure, because Technology, it's just my lens is higher education, so I'll speak to that. U.S. universities right now are investing huge amounts of money in technology with no cost savings yet to be seen there. And, um, and so I think that there is a lot of investment required to make technology effective. And I think that we should be doing that. We should be enhancing the use of technology. But I don't think that we should see it as a cost savings, at least for the next 10 years. Uh, I think there's a lot more building up of, an, of investment before we perhaps then see some cost savings down the road. Thank you, Anne Claire. I think the next question is also aimed at you um, from Kafue Mau. He asks, being resident in a country can be interesting, but doesn't that defeat the purpose to a large extent? These efforts should really be locally driven. So I think the question about how you how we can support human and institutional capacity building in a country owned, locally developed manner. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, it it is perhaps counterintuitive, but I would say that when you're not in country um, the alternative is you're flying in and flying out for short-term engagement. And uh, the way um, development projects often work, the organization that does the flying in and flying out has certain objectives that it wants to meet. And so I think then that that really shapes the agenda that uh, and the discussion that is had in these short encounters, whereas if you're on the ground, you can really build relationships with local uh, leaders and support them in a way that you just really can't when you're when you're coming in a, in a short-term way. So I think it's the residency piece is actually vital to having the local ownership. In the, um, in particular, when development dollars um, are uh, flowing either through the external partner, that then it becomes all the more important to be on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Claire. We have another question coming in um, from Barbara Brown asking whether grants are the only way that one can work with USAID on public-private partnership ideas. And Susan Owen is going to take that question. Yes. Uh, I you say it has become increasingly uh, focused on the public-private sector par partnership angle and is um, promoting these partnerships. And one, day, one way that we do that is through the Global Development Alliance, the GDAs. In this case, you, um, you need to seek private sector uh, buy-in to a project and 
the primary institution submits a proposal to um, one of the partner institutions submits a proposal to USAID uh, for a USAID portion of the partnership. Uh, so that is that is something that we're using increasingly, the GDA. A second, it's USDA. There's a new forum for agricultural research. Is it FFA? There's a new uh, uh, initiative uh, funded by the USDA, which likewise uh, supports uh, private sector and public sector partnerships. And the private sector, the public sector component is not is not offered or not invested until the public, the private sector component is is um, is secured. So uh, yes, there are lots of new mechanisms. Thanks. There's also a question from Christina Caltagiron, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, about the way in which cross-cutting skills can um, help to enhance the capability of students trained in agricultural vocational education. Um, and I think I'm going to interpret here that the issue is how can there be support for those individuals who are being trained um, in ways that also enhance the institutions. Do we have a volunteer for addressing that question? I'm going to turn the mic to Mark. I'll respond um, with the context from the report and then a personal observation from uh, 30 years in the trenches as a faculty member. Uh, those soft skills uh, are, are cross-cutting skills uh, to use uh, yours is, uh, are difficult but very, very important and were called for in the BIFAD HICD report, X training in those. Second uh, uh, point is those skills are needed not just for um, uh, students from abroad but for U.S. Uh, students also, and the the currency, however, is still to have super strong skills in a in a subject matter field such as agronomy or weed sciences or animal sciences or whatever. But you have to go in knowing you need those cross cutting skills to be effective. Thank you. Um, I think this, I'm reading the second part of the question is to understand how those graduates will translate into transforming subsistence farmers into VC participants, which I don't know what that means, but I, I value chain participants, okay. I'm not an agriculture person. Um, so I think that, that um, and I, I wish we could uh, turn the microphone on from someone from IAGRI to explain this better, but my understanding is that a big focus of what they're doing is really changing the way the students think of what their role is upon graduation. They're giving them, one, a lot more practical um, training that gets them out into the field, which I think uh, one issue is that African higher education is often highly theoretical. Um, Curriculum is outdated, and um, and again, lack of engagement with the private sector, lack of, of um, training in entrepreneurship, so that students can create the jobs that don't yet exist, uh, that to serve needs of the of subsistence farmers. Um, so I think that they're really focusing on changing uh, pedagogy and attitudes of students, so that when they graduate, they are. Um, 
finding ways to to address the needs of the small farmer um, with with more of a focus on what uh, more of a focus on what their role is in development. And if anyone from IAGRI can also chime in in the chat box, you probably could uh, provide a better answer than I could. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Claire. Um, we are coming to the end of our question and answer session. I'd certainly like to thank everyone who has participated. We had one more question about um, ways to leverage individual training. Um, how can USAID programs leverage other programs training? And I wonder if we could take that a bit broader to say, or well, to ask people in the discussion starting tomorrow to be thinking of innovative ways that uh, do this kind of leveraging, not only from USAID, but we also want to hear about people's experiences certainly the local experiences that were mentioned just a moment ago, as well as the kinds of experiences that are being funded by other donors. And I have a question on that point for Anne Claire, asking what she has seen in the kind of funding that's coming from the not traditional donors, but some of the new foundations, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations, as well as from the private sector. And maybe we can end our conversation this morning on on that point, uh, trying to point us in, in new directions for activities. Well, um, from, from the foundation side, over the last, uh, well, about 12 years ago, a partnership was launched among the seven major foundations, and then it expanded to, I think, about um, eight or nine since, with a big focus on African higher education. It was called the Partnership for Higher Education in Africa. And I think uh, together they put um, 100 million or more into African higher education. Well, unfortunately, that partnership is now over. The foundations, several of them continued a focus on African higher education after the partnership ended. But my understanding is that that actually foundation support I would say is not growing in this area to to higher education and higher education in Africa. Um, I think the I know the Gates Foundation is funding Roof Forum, the regional universities forum for agricultural capacity development, and they have been for several years. They also fund Award uh, African Women um, in Science in Agriculture, uh, but l largely uh, the Gates Foundation. I would say has not uh, seen higher education as um, having a direct enough impact on the small farmer, and uh, and so from that lens has not invested as much as we would hope to see, and that might be changing in the future. My understanding is they're looking at their human and institutional capacity development investments and beginning to think about how do they look at institutions at the institutions that they fund and not through them to the communities that those institutions serve. So by looking at them, then you're really getting into this question of what is their performance and how do we start to improve it. Improve it. So I, I think there's, um, I, I have hope that the, the broader development community, aside from bilateral and multilateral donors, are going to move in this direction. Um, but the last uh, um, several years have not been um, have not shown a real strong focus on it. Thank you. time for one participants here. Um, any questions that we have not addressed that have come in this morning, and you can still add some, we will take up over the next three days in the Ag Exchange discussion. And we encourage you to register for that if you have not by following the link on the, the web page. But I'd like to turn over to Susan Owens for a few concluding comments on what AID is 
um, thinking about the discussion today and where we might be going in the future. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. We're very excited about the discussion today and see already that many of the issues that we, uh, are of great concern to us at USAID, to the BIFAD, and to the APLU uh, have been highlighted already. Uh, I see John Virens was asking about systemic um, issues related to HICD. We increasingly are uh, discussing how we can address uh, systemic capacity development. The issue of public-private partnerships is critical and is going to lead us into the future. The use of technology, the use of um, investments in, a, in an increasingly um, uh, difficult budgetary environment, the need for um, donor coordination, uh, so many different elements, the, the institutional performance component. These have all come out today. We are looking for um, your views on these important issues looking into the future, and we hope that you all will register the Ag Exchange and join us in, a, in our discussion from November 18th to the, to the 20th. And thank you very much for your participation. Back to Deborah. Very excited. Thank you, Susan. Helpful summing up the main points that were coming, or main themes that were coming out of the discussion this morning. And as you say, we certainly hope to delve into this in more detail over the next couple of days. I also want to remind everyone we have some polls up on the site, the Adobe Connect site, and we encourage you to answer the questions that are in the polls. They'll be up for another one or two minutes. Um, but at this time, I think we're going to sign off for the webinar, and we thank all of you for your participation. There have been some great questions and some great answers, I must say. And we really look forward to participating with you more over the next few days. Thanks to everyone. Bye-bye.